the In Conversation podcast series with author Nigel Beckles. Welcome to the podcast. podcast. Please like the podcast, podcast. and subscribe podcast. to this channel. Podcast. Thank you. Podcast. Have you experienced several failed relationships or been through a divorce? How can you avoid making the same mistakes again? How to avoid making the big relationship mistakes is out now. Hi, my name is Nigel Beckles. My new book is packed with practical and common sense strategies that you can use to make better relationship choices. Now you can discover the dangerous myths about love. If your relationship expectations are realistic, why you could be falling in love for all the wrong reasons. How to avoid making the big relationship mistakes. It's a book that could change your life. Available from Amazon.co.uk. Kindle version also available. The very best way to promote your podcasts. Podpage makes it easy to create a podcast website with just a few clicks. Every page is optimized to be found on Google and it stays up to date forever. For more information visit podpage.com. The future of podcast promotion. The Exposing the Narcissist podcast series. Narcissists are dangerous social and relationship predators. Narcissists can severely damage the lives of other people. Learn essential information regarding how to protect yourself from a relationship nightmare. <laughs> Exposing the Narcissist Podcast Series. Get ready for takeoff. The Exposing the Narcissist in Relationships Podcast Series. With Marcia Hilton and Nigel Beckles. Episode 3. Hi Marcia, how are you doing? I'm very well, thank you Nigel. And how are you? I'm very well, thank you. Well, this is going to be our third episode on narcissists and narcissistic personality disorder. Mm -hmm. And I think the first thing to say is all abusive relationships are motivated by the abuser seeking power and control. Absolutely. The thing with narcissism, though, even though the term is thrown around quite loosely these days, is there is such a thing as healthy narcissism. Now, healthy narcissism is a term some people do not like, but healthy narcissism exists. Many people may have traits of narcissism without meeting the criteria for the personality disorder. Healthy narcissism is a category of its own, and it's actually very positive. So people with healthy narcissism, they are self-aware, they like to collaborate but they're not exploitative they're flexible they're firm but respectful they are team players but also as we know they are toxic narcissists the toxic narcissist has toxic traits and also with narcissists it's not a one-size-fits-all description of the personality disorder there are different types mm. of narcissists computer what are the different types of narcissists engage narcissism exists on a spectrum and there are many different types of narcissism. While a person can be diagnosed with narcissistic personality disorder, NPD, there is no clinical diagnosis for any subtypes of narcissism. Some types of narcissism have been identified and validated by peer-reviewed research. Other types have been informally named and popularized by various mental health professionals. There is not a specific number of narcissistic subtypes. Types of narcissism and narcissists recognized by experts include grandiose narcissism, in psychology, grandiosity refers to having an unrealistic sense of superiority. Grandiose narcissism thus involves overestimating one's abilities, asserting one's dominance over others, and having a generally inflated sense of self-esteem. Somatic narcissism. Somatic narcissists often obsess over their weight and physical appearance and criticize others based on their appearance. Cerebral narcissist. Cerebral or intellectual narcissists derive their self-importance from their minds. Cerebral narcissists believe they are more intelligent than other people. Then we have the overt narcissist who tends to be aggressive and have extreme delusions of grandeur and the need for attention. And then there is the covert narcissist who I think those type of narcissists are the most dangerous of all. Computer, what are the traits of a covert narcissist? Engage. Covert narcissist can be challenging to identify. The DSM-5 criteria for narcissistic personality disorder includes the following. Arrogant behavior. Preoccupied with illusions about success, brilliance or beauty. Demands continuous praise from others. Easily envious of what others have. Exaggerates achievements and talents. Expects to be recognized as superior even without results or evidence to support these claims. Expects others to meet their needs or expectations without question. Has an inflated sense of entitlement. Feels superior to others and believes they can only be understood by equally superior people. 
takes advantage of and exploits others without remorse to reach personal goals. Extreme lack of empathy or any regard for the feelings of others. Concealed smugness or superiority. They may not express any obvious negativity regarding what they are feeling. Likely to express a sense of their irritation or annoyance verbally or through their body language. Examples of this may include glares, lack of eye contact, rolling of their eyes or other dismissive gestures. Known to be highly self-absorbed, passive-aggressive, highly sensitive, vindictive. I would have to agree with you about the covert narcissist being the worst. I feel that they, because they hide, they hide. They're kind of like right there before you, but hidden in plain sight is, is the word that I would probably the phrase that I would use with these people. And they come over as charming, um, intelligent, everybody likes them. So they have a public face and a private face. So in public face, they're the nicest people you could ever hope to meet. And then the private face behind closed doors, that's when they are so vindictive and mean and quite evil, actually, towards their partner. So for me, the covert narcissist is actually the worst. With the overt narcissist, because we know that they are aggressive, they're grandiose, they are exploitative, you know what you're getting. And most people can see that and will avoid them like the plague. Then you have this cerebral narcissist narcissists again they're easier to spot I would say than the covert because again having a conversation with them you will see the superiority and they you know, can see this kind of like feelings of grandeur that you can actually see being displayed by the cerebral narcissist as well and of course you've got the somatic one who's always preening themselves you'll see them you know in the gym with the muscles or if it's a female you know you know they'll be the best thing since sliced bread and they will let everybody know well, regardless of whether they're over or covert, um, they do have certain traits in common. For example, they're in constant pursuit of attention, recognition, status, prestige, and money. They are excessively self-absorbed, obsessed with wealth, power, status, and possessions. Um, and whether covert or overt, they are very vindictive and they will seek revenge if they perceive their fragile ego has been attacked. So let's talk a little bit about how they lure unsuspecting people into relationships. In a previous episode, we discussed love bombing. But one of the other tactics they use within the love bombing stage is mirroring. Computer, what is mirroring? Engage. Mirroring is a manipulation tactic used by relationship predators to secure very rapid intimacy and trust with the target or victim. Narcissists and other abusive personality types often study other people carefully. To discover what they need to know for the purpose of manipulation, mirroring is designed to encourage the target or victim to share their deepest dreams, but also any fears and vulnerabilities, which will eventually be used against them. This strategy is also used to assist the abuser in determining how they can use the other person. This could be for sex, to increase their status by association, or for financial assistance. Another abusive tactic they often use is emotional baiting, which involves playing with the emotions of others. Emotional baiting is usually employed to elicit negative emotions. Basically, they try and bait the other person into an argument, and they can do that in various ways. For example, they may make untrue accusations. They may play the victim. They may try and make their partner jealous by flirting with other people. You know, and that goes along with the other tactics, you know, like the silent treatment, ignoring you if they're upset, sulking, and a range of other things we've spoken about before. But in terms of emotional baiting, the best response is no response. Don't let them push your buttons. Don't get drawn into any silly arguments. If you're in a relationship with someone who's an emotional baiter, your best course of action is to leave. Because with emotional baiting, there can be a result of reactive abuse. Mm-hmm. So a person can react negatively to being abused, which is understandable. But then the narcissist will turn that around often and say the person being abused is actually the abuser. Because right. as we know, narcissists are excellent at playing the victim. In terms of emotional baiting, I think it's probably the worst. They, um, you know, will turn it around to make it as if you were the, you know, they're the victim. You are the one that's causing a problem. They are never in the wrong. And, you know, they get you to the point where you actually, <laughs> I'm not even sure if you actually believe it, but it's almost like you, almost like you can't believe what's what's actually being said and done because you're thinking this, no, 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 this isn't right. This is what I meant. I didn't, that's not what I meant. I meant this, but they're interpreting it in a 
described in a particular way and you know emotionally baiting and making it feel as if you know we have wronged them in some way all the while knowing what they are doing is it's a deliberate thing to make us feel bad really the jealousy um aspect of it as well when and they're flirting with other people and sometimes you know involving other people so they kind of triangulate i know that it can be triangulation can be doesn't necessarily have to be somebody who is romantically involved with them but more often than not it is so it'll be um flirting with somebody outrageously in front of you and they will compare you negatively with that person or even strangers even so and when a person tries to use jealousy as a weapon it's a clear sign that your emotions are being used to manipulate you but you mentioned flirting Mm. and what i have observed a great deal in the several support groups that i belong to as well as the group i co-created several years ago is once a person has been discarded often Mm. they are jealous and distraught because the narcissist has moved on so quickly with a new partner and as we know the narcissist has already groomed the new partner or the new supply before they leave their current partner now the ex-partner and there is a misconception that the new supply is somehow better than the person who's been left and they are often left feeling they're not good enough or they can spend many hours comparing themselves to the replacement and they can also be desperate for answers but the reality is the new supply is not better they simply possess something that the narcissist wants or needs at that current moment because with a narcissist as their needs change so they must change their supply absolutely or if they feel they're going to be discovered within a relationship they will be making plans to leave because as we know they do not like to be held accountable and they do not take responsibility and at the end of the day i always say a person does not have to be a mental health professional to observe or decide if another person is toxic because toxic is toxic if you're going to wait around for a official diagnosis you could well be putting yourself at further emotional and mental risk and the other thing is of course is that narcissists really go for a diagnosis or assessment anyway because they believe they're the best thing since sliced bread. They believe there's nothing wrong with them and they're perfect. I think, you know, based on what what you've just said there, especially if, you know, you you made the statement that if we're going to wait around... Uh, for, for things to be different you know then we're putting our mental and emotional health at risk and I think again it's really about and it's very difficult when you're in that situation especially if you are unaware who you are dealing with but there is this thing I think that if you know that what is happening to you did not deserve this if you know that you deserve better if you have proper boundaries in place then you know to step away but it's difficult when you're in it and you're, you're unaware of what's of what's happening oh very very difficult very difficult indeed those qualities that these you know that is that targets have with empathy they are good people these are things that the narcissist don't have but want so they want to steal bits of you either gender can be targeted by a narcissist Absolutely. i mean they are personality traits that make a person more susceptible to abusers in general and a personality trait is not a whole personality a personality mm. trait could be the person's been previously abused or previously been in a abusive relationship they may engage in negative self-talk they may have low self-esteem they might have a fear of being single they might be a bit of a people pleaser they may have poor boundaries and a variety of other personality traits that they're not even aware of but yeah. it makes them more susceptible to being abused. Absolutely. And that's why it's important to do that, that inner work. Oh, it's definitely. Amazing. Most definitely. Counselling, therapy, online support groups, actual support groups. You know, they're all important. All important for recovery and for healing and yeah. for moving on. So, Marcia, what are your recommendations for recovery and healing? The first thing is, in terms of recovery, is go no contact. You have to, I think, you cannot recover. You can't even begin the process of recovery if you are still having contact with the with the perpetrator, with the narcissist, if you're still having conversations with him, if you're still 
asking for an explanation. If you're still wanting to get closure, you are not healing. You need to separate because you're just not going to get the closure from it from a narcissist. That, that's something that you're just not going to get because they don't actually want closure. They want an opportunity to be able to pop back up in your life at a later date. You're only being put on a shelf until a later date. So you are the one that has to actually do the discarding. You're the one that has to do closure. We are the ones that have to do that. So and to start off in in terms of healing go no contact break all contact i know it's more difficult if you've got um, children or some sort of commitment with them then that makes it a little bit more difficult but i think the first thing in terms of healing is the least contact you can have with these people the better well you mentioned closure well i believe the only closure a person really needs is understanding that they deserve better because i can guarantee that a person who ghosts another person and fails to give that person and closure it's not the first time they have ghosted a partner right because with them it's it's a pattern of behavior because again we go back to not wanting to be accountable or be responsible because in a healthy relationship obviously not all relationships work out but Mm. there is a way that you know you sit down as two adults and you might say well this is not working etc and even you may be unhappy that the relationship's ending but at least you've got an idea as to why but i always say the failure to provide closure is very immature and cowardly that is my position and i would have to agree so what do you think about support groups i think support groups are very useful i think they do serve a really good purpose it helps people because remember when sometimes when people have suffered narcissistic abuse a lot of the time they think they're on their own that they're the only ones that have experienced experience something like this so for um a support group to be there for them that they can tap into is actually really helpful it's 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 actually part of the healing process because you're thinking i'm actually not on my own somebody else has experienced this i have you know you now have something that you can have as a bit of a frame of reference whereas you probably wouldn't have had that before because this is so unlike anything that you've experienced before like he was saying earlier it is not like a normal relationship and trying to explain this to somebody who has never experienced it it's it's very difficult they don't get it so you do feel quite isolated and on your own so having a support group where people are having similar experiences is really is really very helpful i think and is very useful for the recovery journey well as you know i created a support group Um, reflections on abusive relationships on facebook um several years ago we now have twenty one thousand plus members and i have to say a very big thank you to the admin team for the group uh because the group could not manage effectively without them but i think Mm. support groups are very valuable resource because as you said it is very isolating when you're in an abusive relationship and it doesn't have to be an abusive relationship with a narcissist any type of abusive relationship can make a person feel very lonely because one of the tactics an abuser will use is isolation. And I often read in these groups and with some of the people I support, they tell me they felt it was only happening to them or they were the only person who had been through that. And I think support groups are a great, a great resource. I really do. Besides support groups, obviously therapy and counseling can also be very helpful. And one of the key things when a person is recovering from a abusive relationship is self-care. Absolutely. And the goal is to get from victim to survivor to striver, to get your life back together, to, to move on and live the best life that you can. Well, Marcia, thank you very much. This has been very interesting and intriguing. Thank you, Nigel. It's been a pleasure. Engage. If you suspect you are in a relationship with a narcissist, or interacting with a person that always seems to be hungry for praise and attention, do your own research, there is plenty of great information online. Thank you for listening. Please like and subscribe. Another In Conversation podcast coming soon.